So uh, for those of you who were here two years ago, uh, John Rose and I stood up here and outlined a fairly ambitious agenda for uh, a sort of co coordinated evolution of the JVM and the Java language to uh, basically reboot the way that the JVM interacts with data in memory. And so this talk is a status report of what we've been doing for the last two years. The, uh, the quick summary is, We've been working on it hard for two years. We've made a lot of progress. We've got a long way to go. So uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, just a reminder, this is focusing mostly on the JVM technology and not on the language side of it. So uh, even though I always make this disclaimer, I know I'm going to see articles about, oh, here's what Java 10 language is going to look like. It's not, OK? All right, so disclaimer slide. Don't believe anything I say. So. Uh, the, um, the agenda that we, uh, that, that we outlined at our last talk uh, became part of what uh, we call Project Valhalla. It's an open JDK project that we've been, like I said, running for the last two years. And it's a good illustration of how a simple idea can balloon into something that, that, that touches basically everything. So we started with a very simple seeming idea, value types. Uh, so value types is a straightforward concept. It's a pure data aggregate like a complex number or an XY point or a tuple that doesn't have any of the ancillary overhead that objects have. Um, and for all the same reasons why Java had primitives in the first place, uh, we want to be able to have a broader set of, uh, of aggregates that behave like primitives so that we can add new, new numeric types, we can add language features uh, without the overhead, et cetera. Uh, as we started digging into to this, we discovered something that, well, we already knew, which is that every language feature, every VM feature interacts with every other feature. And so once you add one thing, now you have to adjust everything to work with it. And you can think of this as pulling on one end of a very long string. So in some sense, this talk is a little bit of a tour of the, um, the length and topology of that string, or at least the part that we've, uh, we've pulled out so far. Um, some areas that we've done uh, quite a lot of research into and we think we have a, a good story, some areas are still completely unknown, so some parts of the map are gonna be better drawn than others. So the motivation for value types is pretty straightforward and uh, as for all our other motivation, we get it from a good source. Uh, to paraphrase uh, you know, what Yoda said, uh, object identity is the root of so many problems. Object identity leads to pointers, pointer leads to indirection, and of course, indirection leads to suffering. And to illustrate this suffering, let's take a, a look at so a data layout of typical Java data structure. Um, if you have a class like an XY point, simple aggregate, you want to have an array of these guys, well, it's not really an array of points. It's an array of references to points. Each reference is a pointer. Each pointer points to an object in the heap that has to be allocated and garbage collected. Each of those objects has a header, which has at least two words, usually one for tracking identity-related things, garbage collection, et cetera, and the other for um, storing the object's type state. And so what started out as a fairly simple thing, an array of XY points, has ballooned into something that uses more memory than necessary. Bernard talked about density, that's, uh, that's an issue. Has a lot more indirection than necessary, which is a big deal on today's processors where the cost of a, of a cache miss is substantial. Um, and this is not, just not the data structure that we, the layout that we asked for, right? The programmer probably had in mind something more like this. Um, and so, you know, what, one, one of the, you know, the fundamental questions for Project Valhalla is what code do we want to write to get a layout like this? Seems simple, right? How could it be taking so long? Well, it's a long string. So we think that this is the code we want to write. It's a way of saying this, cl this class, this XY point aggregate, is a special kind of class. It's a value class. And I'm, a value class is willing to give up on object identity in exchange for getting some benefits. Um, so um, what, what, are, what, are, what are those benefits? Let, so let me um, start with now that we've been working on this for two years, we finally figured out what our goals for the project are. So let me summarize those. Uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the high order bit uh, are de memory density and memory flatness. So we would like to be able to squeeze out extraneous object headers, extraneous pointers, extraneous indirections from representing straightforward graphs of data where they don't add value. Sometimes they do add value. If you have representational polymorphism, then yes, having a pointer and header representation makes a lot of sense. If you just want to grovel over a big array of complex numbers, 
it doesn't add value and you, and you want to get rid of it. But more generally, uh, when, when there's a performance cost to doing something or when there's a perceived performance cost to doing something, developers often mess up their code in order to get better performance. And even though we wish most of them would stop doing that because most of the time it's, it's a bad trade, uh, the best way to get them to stop doing that, we tried the education route, that didn't work. So the best way you know, that, that we can think of is to try not to put developers in a position where they perceive that they have to make a choice between performance and abstraction, type safety, encapsulation, doing the right thing. So eliminate the temptation to unroll that array of XY points into two arrays of its, which I know people do. Um, eliminate the need for library writers to write handwritten specializations of things. How many people here have used the Java 8 streams library? Right? How many people here kind of see the specialized streams like in-stream, long-stream, double-stream as a regrettable wart? I certainly do. Um, it was painful to write them. It's painful to use them. Um, we had to. We had no other choice. The performance of, bo of arithmetic on boxed uh, um, primitives is terrible, but it wasn't a good, you know, it, it wasn't a good result uh, because there's a lot more code. We give up a lot of abstraction. It was, a, it was a necessary evil. We'd like to get rid of that necessary evil. So we would like for be able, people to be able to use generics to write the code once and abstract over all the different um, you know, da data types. So uh, value types and by extension generics over values eliminate these cost frictions. So that's the performance side of it. But the flip side of that is the expressiveness. Um, having you know, those hand specialized classes like in-stream and double-stream, it's an abstraction violation. It's not complete. We didn't do all of the, uh, the primitives because we didn't want to balloon up the, uh, the runtime. And it still doesn't scale well to things like streams of tuples. So we would like to make generics more powerful so that you can abstract over all the types, abstract over not just references, but primitives, values, and even, even the, lack of, uh, the lack of data, so that people can write things once rather than n plus one times. You know? So we have lots of code in the JDK, like arrays.fill, that has to be written nine times. That's silly, right? So uh, we have a performance goal. We also have an expressiveness goal here. And the two work out, uh, the work pretty well together. Um, as a sort of third goal, in order to make this actually work, not only do we have to provide VM and language features that let you do the right thing, we also have to f find a path for our existing libraries that now, by, in our historical relativism, now do the wrong thing, to find their way to the right place. And migrating existing libraries is even harder than writing new libraries. And so in addition to the VM features, the language features for expressing what you want to be able to express, we also need some features from migrating existing code to come into this new world. We did this with the default methods in Lambda, where uh, by adding default methods, we were able to um, add a conversion from collection to stream so that you could do filter map produce over existing collections. We need the same kind of thing for, uh, for these features. So OK, that's the goal. Let's, um, let's grab the starting point to the string and start pulling. So value types, you can think of them as pure data aggregates. They're just the data, no identity. Um, they don't admit representational polymorphism. They can't have subclasses or superclasses. That's one of the things you trade away. So XY point, fine, but you can't have, you know, an XYZ point extends the XY, XY point. They're not mutable. Uh, they're not nullable. Um, and equality, because there's no identity, uh, is based on their data, not their state. Sorry, not their identity. Uh, and so by giving up a few things, by giving up identity, by giving up polymorphism, uh, representational polymorphism, by giving up um, on mutability, we get a bunch of things. We are able to get the data layout that looks more like the what we want slide than the what we have slide. Uh, values can be routinely flattened into enclosing objects or other values. They can routinely be flattened into arrays. We don't need an object header. Um, and we essentially get aggregates that behave with the, the runtime characteristics of primitives. So there's sort of two ways to look at it. You can look at these things as programmable primitives, or you can look at it as classes that behave like primitives, two sides of the same coin. So unlike primitives, you get a bunch of things that only classes have had. They can have methods, they can have fields, they can implement interfaces, they can use encapsulation to hide their state. So you can have values with private components. They can be generic. You can have a generic value, optional of T. Um, 
and so this is, you know, not only allows us to extend the, you know, the, the, the set of primitive-like classes, but allows, us, allows library writers to write rich abstractions that are going to perform well. Now, there's a zillion questions about value types, uh, of, of which about 90% can be answered by the general rubric, what would int do? So if you want to know what happens when you assign a value to, to object, well, what happens when you assign int to object? It gets boxed. Same thing. That trick actually works really well. That should, so, you know, so that should be your first assumption of, well, what would a primitive do in this situation? And you pretty much get the behavior a value would do. So our, our, our mantra, which you know, may, or, may or may not survive the, uh, the product launch, is codes, codes like a class works like an int. Actually, it works more like a long because of word tearing, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but but this, this is, this is our, uh, what we generally have in mind. All of the abstracted capabilities of classes with the runtime performance behavior primitives. Nice story, right? OK. So who cares? Well, who wants these new things? Well, my argument is everybody, right? First and foremost, people who write applications that deal with a lot of data, scientific computing, um, you know, they want to be able to reason about footprint and predictability. They don't want to give over 60% of their memory to object headers. They don't want to be taking cache misses all the time. So application writers who deal with data definitely want these. Library writers want these too. Uh, if you want to be able to write library-based numerics, 128-bit int, uh, complex number, uh, algebraic data types, uh, you know, things like um, you know, uh, optional and choice, uh, you know, cursors, these are all a great fit for writing as library-based classes. And you can think about this a little bit as, you know, there's a little bit of inspiration here, or a lot of inspiration from Guy Steele's Growing a Language talk. Who here has seen Growing a Language? Anybody who hasn't, which is most of you, write this down, go home tonight, and watch it. Growing a Language, Guy Steele from Oopsla about 15 years ago, one of the best talks ever done. You, you, you won't regret it. Um, there's also a paper, but the talk is more fun. Um, library writers want these not just for writing library abstractions, but for improving the performance of existing, existing abstractions. Uh, so if you look at the way linked list works, right? So you have linked list of T, the, it has a corresponding you know, linked list node class, which holds a T, which means you have to take two, data, two pointer indirections to get to your data. If the, um, if the data can be inlined into the node, which is what you would get from a, you know, a, a value type, uh, it makes library-based abstractions more efficient. Similarly, hash map with fewer indirections is going to be faster. If hash map is faster, all Java applications are faster. So library writers want these. But you know, also, for the people in this room, compiler writers really want these. Right? If you have a language that has tuples, it's really galling to have to turn that into an object. Um, you know, if you have multiple return, if you have numeric types that don't happen to be the exact eight numeric types the JVM gives you, um, I, how many people here are in this pain? Right. So, you know, I feel your pain. You know, we, we maintain a compiler too. We would like to uh, uh, extend its range of features. So, this is a, a tool that's that's useful to the compiler writers as well. So, everybody wants value types. Pulling on the string, um, it would be pretty silly to have value types, but not to be able to have generics over values that didn't have to resort to boxing. So, you know, we can express everything we want with array list of integer, but you just feel dirty every time you do it, right? And um, you know, it, the, the performance sucks. You get a data layout that looks like the first, you know, what we have now slide when you take an array list of, of integer. Um, you know, for all the same reasons. Uh, too many objects header, too many indirections, too much allocation, too much GC. So what we really want is array list of int and have it backed by a real int array. Is that so much to ask? Um, so, you know, obviously, we, you know, we want to do value types, but if we did values without generics over values, it would look woefully incomplete. And this is where the string gets really complicated. So before we dive into the details of generics, which I will, um, I just want to look at a couple of alternatives that we could have done. Uh, these were some roads not taken. Um, people ask, why do you have to invent this new value type thing? Why don't you just do structs? And th th those, those of you who know me uh, know that I don't respond very well to questions that start with, why don't you just? Um, the, the, the questions like that always uh, belie incorrect assumptions. You know, the question suggests that structs are actually simpler than values. And they're not. They're just more familiar because we saw them first, right? We all remember structs from C, uh, when, you know, when, and so it seems like, oh, it's a very basic thing. But it's not. 
structure this weird half one thing, half another thing. Sometimes they have identity, sometimes they don't. Uh, if you have a struct that's a member of, um, you know, of, 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 an, of another aggregate, it inherits the identity from its enclosing um, aggregate. If you have a struct held in a local variable, the runtime has to invent an identity for it so it can be mutated. Um, and you need both pass by value, pass by reference to do structs. Um, Java only has pass by value, which is a good thing. We view that as a simplicity. So this is adding a big new feature to, add, you know, to support the simpler thing. And it really comes down to structs are actually more work and more complexity than values. It's not really an A or B, it's an A or A and B, where values are A. Uh, so our conclusion was, and we, we, you know, if people have questions, we can take this to the, uh, the, the workshop uh, later today. Our conclusion was this, is, this isn't a winner. This is, just gonna, this is gonna be more complex, harder to reason about, a lot harder to optimize. Um, values are a lot simpler. A more sensible alternative that we could have pursued, uh, but we chose not to, is, uh, is tuples. Um, you know, in the JVM, it would be fairly easy to denote a tuple of like int and long as you know, open paren ij. That would fit kind of nicely into the bytecode instruction set. Uh, and it would be pretty straightforward to have opcodes for pushing and popping and destructuring tuples. And the semantics are easy and the verifier would be happy and all of that. And we actually looked at this and asked ourselves like how much work is this? And it turns out, it's almost as much work. It's a lot of work. Um, and it's a lot of intrusiveness into the class file format. But it doesn't give you everything values does. It doesn't give you encapsulation. So you can't have values that encapsulate private data, which means you can't have a safe wrapping for native pointers, for example. And it, you also give up on nominality. Right? So if you have two tuples that have the same structure, like an xy point and an int range, they would be the same runtime type. Um, and so, you know, Java has a strong commitment to nominality that if you design, you know, if you design a class, classes have names. Names carry meaning. Uh, it makes it harder for people to make mistakes uh, just because two things happen to be an int, even though they have different interpretations. And so our conclusion for the why not just do tuples was we could do that. It would cost a little less. It would have measurably less benefit, and it didn't seem like you know, the best, uh, you know, the best choice. But at least it wasn't an outright silly choice. So what does it mean to say that JVM supports value types? It raises a lot of questions. How do we construct a value? How do we move values but, uh, from the stack to the local variables? How do we access their components, invoke their behavior? How do we embed them in other aggregates like other values or objects? How do we write them down in a field descriptor or a method descriptor? Um, you know, how do we convert between values and objects? These are all questions that have to do with bytecode representation. So it means that to have values, we need some new bytecodes, we need some new type descriptors, we probably need some new constant pool forms, and as an added bonus uh, to make things just more fun, uh, values don't have known fixed size. All the other things the VMs used to deal with have fixed size. Uh, references are either 32 or 64 bits, depending on your architecture. Ints are 32 bits, longs are 64. How big is a value? Depends how many fields it has. And if we want to make changing the representation of a value a binary compatible thing, we don't want to bake the assumption of how many fields it has into the, into the clients. We would like to figure that out at runtime. So this is a new challenge for VM architects. Um, so this immediately raises the question of stack slots. Uh, if an int takes one slot and a long takes two slots, if I have a point with two longs as its components, how many slots is that? Well, the obvious answer is four, but we don't really like that answer very much because it means that any client of point is gonna assume, okay, I know exactly how big it is, and that means we can't change its representation later. That kind of goes uh, against our commitment to nominality and dynamic linkage. Um, so we'd like the answer to be some fixed number. Reasonable candidates might be one or two, or you can imagine reasons for three. But um, we would like there to be some fixed size that all values take up this many slots. And actually, the easiest thing would be for everything to take up one slot. Um, how many people here wish we hadn't made longs take up uh, two slots? How many times have people made the mistake of not, uh, not accounting for that extra phantom slot? More than once, more than 10 times. Yes, anybody who writes things that process bytecode make this mistake every week. Uh, so we'd, li we'd, we'd, we'd like for everything to take one slot, but I, I digress. 
Um, okay, so I mentioned converting between values and objects. Uh, we have a story today, what would int do? Well, we have a box class, Java Lang Integer, which is an object, and we have uh, fairly easy transforms between an int and an integer. But that seems, that seems okay when you have eight uh, value types. When you have an infinite number, that seems pretty lousy. Um, we would like to derive the boxes from the value class file, right? So we would like for each value class file to generate two runtime types, an unboxed version that behaves like a primitive and a boxed version that's used for interop with uh, APIs like reflection that deal entirely in object and object array. Um, so our working theory for how we would write down the distinction between an unbox value and a box value is that the box value would continue to be L class name, and then we'd pick another letter, we picked Q for no good reason, um, and the, the uh, unboxed value would be represented as uh, a Q type. So the, the, the point.class class file gives rise to two runtime types, L point, the boxed version, and Q point, the unboxed version. This may change, but this is our working theory today. And um, you know, the big part of the motivation for this has to do with how do we ensure uh, migration compatibility for classes that started their life as reference classes and then got turned into value classes along the way, like we want to do with optional or local date time or a number of other classes in the JDK. So okay, we need a way to write down the name of a value type. We, we, we uh, proposed one there, Q point. Uh, we also need some bytecodes that can move values around. Um, and uh, bytecode design has a lot of constraints. It has a lot of constituents. Uh, we're running out of bytecode, so that's, uh, that's one constraint that, uh, that we're very mindful of. Uh, but there are many constituents that, that, uh, that use bytecode. The VM itself, the garbage collector, and the verifier, uh, we would like for the bytecode set to make it easy for those uh, components of the VM to do their job. Um, we want to make it reasonably easy for compiler writers to transform programs into bytecode. And similarly, for, uh, uh, for tools, more importantly, actually, for tools, to be able to take bytecode and derive properties of the program. So there's lots of trade-offs for um, you know, how, we, uh, you know, how we pick these new bytecodes. Uh, there, there are opportunities for overloading where we can take existing bytecode and just give them more functionality at the cost of more complexity, or we could invent you know, a, a larger number of new bytecodes. Um, our, 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 our working theory, mostly from a not expanding the bytecode set too much, is to have uh, a single new bytecode called typed, which acts as a prefix, kind of like wide, um, and it modifies the uh, properties of the following bytecode. So uh, the, um, to push a, a point on the stack, you would use a load and prefix it with a typed point prefix. Not clear whether this is gonna be the final answer, but it's not a bad, um, not a bad starting point for a prototype. So let's take a look at um, you know, um, some bytecode. So here's an example of a simple class that consumes an XY point uh, value. Note the horrible syntax, which is deliberate. We don't want to talk about language syntax here. We just want to you know, illustrate that there is some way to construct a point. Maybe it's new, maybe it's not. Not interested in having that conversation for a couple years. So um, the, uh, you, you know, just like any constructor invocation, you're gonna push the arguments on the stack and there will be a bytecode for making a new, uh, a new value type. Maybe it'll be invoked static of a factory, we're not sure, but, uh, but there, there's, 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 there's some way to say, make me one of those and put the result on the stack. So now there's a cue point on the top of the stack. Um, and then we save it off because we're gonna use it twice, so we uh, save it to a local variable. Note that the, um, the vstore bytecodes, um, they have an extra operand. They don't just say what, um, you know, what uh, local, uh, local variable slot are we putting it in, but they also say the type. And that's important because the VM has to know how big this thing is, how many bytes it has to move. Um, and so this raises one of the questions we saw earlier, how many slots does this take up? Um, and then we extract a field from it, which might be get field, might be v get field, but there, there's some way to do that, and then that results in the field uh, being on the top of the stack, just like any other get field. We store that off into a local variable, and then um, you know, we, we retrieve the, uh, the value again out of our, our, our local variable um, and do a get field for y and store it off, okay? So this gives you the flavor of what our, um, our prototype does now, fairly straightforward. Basically, we're adding a new family of types to that which can be moved by the, the various data movement bytecodes, you know, load, store, return, and uh, along with those, you have to carry the static type along with you. So if you're returning a point, vReturn is gonna say, I'm returning a Q point. 
pretty straightforward. Okay, so more, more things tied to the string. Uh, lots of questions for, uh, for our root type, object. Does object continue to be the top type? That's the choice that uh, the .NET folks made when they, when they added uh, value types to, you know, to .NET. Uh, but it does seem kind of like the notion of has identity should be reflected in the static type system somewhere. So wedging everything into object seems a little, uh, a little weird. Um, should there be a new any type? Uh, well, if you ask any programmer, their answer is of course, until you start to ask them, all right, well, what would the in-memory representation of an array of any be? And then they like wander off and change the subject or something like that. Um, you know, clearly value types want to have methods like hash code and equals. So those should be defined somewhere, but they also clearly don't want to have methods like wait and notify, because those are identity-based. So where do these get inherited from? Not from object, but maybe from somewhere. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, what do we do with primitives? Do, can we retrofit primitives as values somehow, or is there, is there always going to be some odd third wheel? So these are, these are some questions that, um, you know, we've, we've been asking ourselves for a while. We don't have, have all the answers yet, but we're making some progress. So one thing that we've made a tremendous amount of progress on, and this is going to be the, the uh, majority of my talk today, is what do we do about generics? And this is where a lot of the complexity is. So generics in Java always embedded a kind of uneasy compromise, uh, which is that you can't generify over primitives. The reason for that is, um, you know, was, it was a pragmatic choice at the time. There's no common top type in the VM type system between object and int. There's no bytecode that can move both an, an object and an int. So we had no idea how to translate it. Um, and by assuming away primitives in the generics design, we solved a lot of problems, um, most notably that it worked on the VM that we had in, um, in 2004. Uh, but, you know, today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. Generics over primitives kind of suck. The performance sucks. Uh, you know, it puts a lot more pressure on the, on the, on the GC um, and forces library writers to compensate with tricks like in-stream, which we would like to avoid. So, People pick on erasure, and you know, to some degree, you know, we deserve it. But I, I think erasure overall gets a bad rap. I think erasure was a very pragmatic compromise. It enabled us to have generics with the VM that we had. It allowed us to get this additional type safety with basically no additional runtime costs uh, and no additional runtime footprint. There wasn't an explosion of uh, class file footprint with separate representations for list of integer and list of string. Uh, we were able to share the representation. And you know, one thing that we did very well in, the, in, in generics is this gradual migration compatibility thing, where you generify a library, and its clients and subclasses have a choice of generifying now, generifying later, generifying never. And that's really powerful. I mean, flag days are horrible. Having a flag day where we say, OK, everybody on Tuesday has to recompile the world. It works if you have no users, but if you have, you know, have a user base the size of our user, it's a non, our user base, it's a non-starter. Um, because libraries exist in different maintenance domains than their applications, right? We develop the Java collections uh, you know, here at Oracle. Everybody uses them. They don't have the opportunity to go recompile uh, the, the JDK, or they do, but, but it's unreasonable to ask them to do so. So if you want to be able to evolve libraries across uh, maintenance domains, you need a degree of, um, you know, of, of migration compatibility. And, and we did, I think, a very good job with this in generics, and we want to continue to do that as we extend generics. So, okay, so let's say we want to be able to have specialized generics over primitives and values. Um, the, the, the straw man syntax for this is we have a modifier to the generic type variable any, where you can say this is generics over a broader domain. Uh, there's actually a reason why we need that. We can't just automatically reinterpret old source files as being any generic. Um, so, okay, that's a reasonable looking class. Uh, raises a lot of questions. What should be the method and field descriptors of those methods? Uh, what bytecodes do we use to push a T or pop a T or, 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 or what have you? Um, and you know, on the right column, I have, here's what the descriptors looked like under erase generics. Clearly, that's not going to be good enough. So um, what should they look like? So about uh, almost two years ago, we built our first prototype of this, uh, which we now call Model 1. We didn't call it that at the time, um, where we basically spewed out extra metadata into the class file where we would annotate an A load that was moving an object with metadata that said, oh, by the way, this object came from T, but that object came from you. And then we had a runtime specializer that would take apart the bytecode, take the metadata, and, and turn all the A loads to I loads. And, and, 
the amazing thing is it worked. I mean, it really did work. It was, it was really cool. Um, and it was all done with compiler trickery and class loader trickery, so it didn't involve the VM, also cool. But it was a mess. It was very intrusive. I did a talk on this last year here, for those of you who saw it, um, where I went through the characteristics of our sort of uh, first few rounds of prototypes. It was incredibly intrusive. Uh, and the, re the result was it touched basically every bit in the class file. And you know, we ended up with a lousy programming model with no commonality between list of int and list of float and no wild cards. So it was a great proof of concept to prove that it was possible to do, and it would have been a lousy idea to think about shipping that approach. Um, as I said, you know, our prime directive here is compatibility. We need to have gradual migration compatibility. So we want for taking an existing class, list of t, and nifying it, list of any t, to be source and binary compatible, uh, both for clients and for subclasses. And for subclasses, it's, it's harder. Um, similarly, you know, if you have an existing, uh, like, uh, enclosing um, you know, type, an outer type, you want to be able to add new generic type variables that have that be a compatible thing. Um, what we end up with is a scheme where you anify from the top down. So uh, you can anify your top types like you know, list, list of t, array list of t first, and then the subclasses have the option to anify or not now or later. But we certainly don't want to, you know, like I said, require, require flag days. So one of the reasons why the first uh, prototype kind of failed was that the bytecode set is kind of hostile to parametric polymorphism. Uh, it has all of these non-orthogonalities where uh, you know, some data types take one slot, some take two, but also sometimes you use different instructions for different data types. So if you want to do a compare and branch on a reference, you have a fused operation if a comp, but if you want to do the same thing with floats, you do an f comp and an if which makes it difficult to have one class file that describes uh, generics over uh, you know, any possible uh, type instantiation. And the same thing is true for array creation and for default values. The default value for, uh, you know, for a ref is a const null, but it's i const zero for an int. Right? We'd like to have a single representation that that, that, that's generic over all the possible type instantiations. So our third attempt did much better. Um, and what we did was we basically refactored uh, the class file format to move all of the type information into the constant pool. And that's a fairly, that, that's not as horrible as it sounds because most of the information was there already. Um, so we need um, some, uh, some new constant forms to describe the use of type variables and parameterized types. Uh, and we need some bytecodes that can operate across um, you know, any, uh, you know, an abstract type, something that moves a T as opposed to moves an int or a long. And if this works, which it does, um, the end result is that uh, at runtime, specializing list of t into list of int is just a transformation on the constant pool. And it actually turns out to be a simple, fast, dumb mechanical translation on the constant pool, which is good, because we, we like our VM engineers dumb. I mean, we like our RVMs dumb. I, 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 you know what I mean. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's some... Uh, you know, there's, there's still some loose ends. This uh, one slot, two slot thing is still a persistent thorn in our side where we, uh, we have some ideas for that. Uh, we, uh, we'd like to get to where everything can take one slot. Um, but uh, we actually have a prototype of this that works. I'll have a download URL at the, at the end here. Um, so, okay, let's deep dive into some, um, some class file stuff because uh, that's what this audience loves. Um, so uh, we have to reify information about the uh, generic class. So if I have an any generic class, it's going to have a generic class attribute. The generic class attribute acts basically as a table of contents for the type variables so that we have a consistent numbering for type variable number three is t declared in this scope. Um, so if we have, uh, and remember, you know, Java can have nested classes. I can have a class inner of u nested in a class outer of t. And inside the body of inner, I can refer to both t and u, which means I need a consistent numbering both for inner's uh, classes, but all type variables, but also those inherited from outside scope. Um, and there's a pretty straightforward unraveling of uh, how to represent this in the class file format. You don't need to follow all the details, but basically you have an, uh, there's an array of scopes, one corresponding to each enclosing class, and within each one you have uh, an entry for every type variable, what's its name, what's its bound, is it anyfied, and that way we have um, a consistent numbering for type variables which we can use. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, more interesting question is, let's say I have a method uh, m that takes a list of int, 
how do I write down the descriptor for that? Seems like an obvious question. Um, the way we approach uh, type descriptors today is, uh, is nominal. They're UTF-8 strings. Um, and uh, we would like to not have to do a tremendous amount of string manipulation at runtime. We would like to represent the notion of list of int in a more structural fashion. So right now, we express a, a class with, um, you know, a, like if you have a, a new bytecode where you say, you know, new list, it refer, the, the new bytecode refers to a constant class in the, uh, the constant pool. So how about we have something like constant class, but one that's parameterized? So it captures not only the name of the class, but the a description of its type parameters. And that's actually pretty straightforward. Um, so the, the first new constant pool form is parameterized type which says, uh, tell me about my, the parameterization of my enclosing type if I'm an inner class. What uh, class am I parameterizing? List, you know, array list, what have you. How many type variables do I have? And what are my type parameters? And those are pointers to other constants in the constant pool. And that's the magic trick, that we can build a tree structured description of a structural type in the constant pool. So the way we would write down list of int uh, is parameterize type whose template class is list and whose type parameter is i, okay? And that's gonna be how we write down list of i, a uh, li li list of int. Now, if I have um, a more deeply nested generic, like list of optional event, because the type parameters point into the constant pool, this is easy. I say this is a parameterized type, the template class is list, the type parameter is another parameterized type, which is optional whose type parameter is i. Okay, so you can see why we don't want to do this with string manipulation in, um, you know, in string signatures. We would much rather represent the structure of, of the type and, um, the, uh, and then do substitutions basically on the leaves of the tree. Okay, um, so, all right, we have this, great. What about erasure? Because we have a lot of class files out there that assume erasure. All the lists of strings out there in compiled class files are really erased lists. So we have to have a way of writing down erased list. Um, so uh, we add to the vocabulary, in addition to a type parameter being any other type, uh, you know, a ground type, a parameterized type, an array type, it can also be this special token that means erased. We use the underscore to describe that. So a list of int is parameterized type of list with i. A list of reified string is parameterized type of list with string. A list of erased is parameterized type of list with type parameter erased. And this turns out to be a pretty powerful trick. Okay, but that wasn't the question I asked. The question I asked was, I have a method descriptor who, uh, that takes a, uh, a list event. How do I write down that method descriptor? Well, I can do the same trick, right? So historically, we, um, we take the nominalization of all the types and concatenate them together, wrap them in parentheses, and that's the nominalization of a method type. Um, but we'd kind of like to have a more structural description so that we can operate on the, the, um, you know, the, the, the leaves of this tree without having to rewrite the whole tree. Well, this is actually really easy, same trick as before. Uh, we have a method descriptor uh, constant, which uh, says, here's how many arguments I have, and then here's n references to other constant pool uh, entries for my type parameters, and another reference to the uh, constant pool entry for my return type. And so the way I uh, would write down um, a method uh, m that takes list of int is a method descriptor that has one argument type, and that argument points to the constant pool entry for a parameterized type that parameterizes list with int. And it works. Well, this is actually, we have, we have this working, it's great. So um, pull on this string some more, what about arrays? What if I wanna have an array of list of int? Well, we can do the same thing. We can have a, uh, a constant to describe array type. So we're basically unrolling some sort of premature optimizations we did 20 years ago of cramming things into strings by maintaining the, the structure of types, both array types and generic types, in the class file. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. So these, um, these structural types form a tree. The intermediate nodes of the tree are uh, structural combinators like parameterization or array. At the leaves of the tree, in the simple case, you have concrete types like int, but you also might have type variables. How would I write down this method takes a list of t? So I do the same trick. We have a, constant, a new constant that describes a, t a type variable use. It encodes the type variable number, which is a index into the table of contents that I talked about earlier. And these type variables also carry around their pre-computed erasure with them. 
So you can think of this as type variable number three, in case of erasure, break glass, and use this concrete type string uh, when you go and specialize. Um, and, and this way, we can describe a list of T as a parameterized type, parameterizing list with type variable, the number for, uh, for T, and then the erasure for T in that context. And because erasure is horribly non-compositional, you get a different erasure depending on different you know, places you use it. Um, and it turns out that, um, that, this, uh, that this trick gives us a very valuable property, which is the VM doesn't have to know anything about erasure except that there exists something called erasure, and if called upon to erase, it can use the pre-computed erasure that's already there in the constant pool. That means you know, not only does the VM not have to understand this horrible complex transform, but it means that different languages can have different erasure schemes, and the VM doesn't care. It just mechanically substitutes stuff based on what's in the constant pool and what's in the, um, you know, the, the argument list for parameterization, which is really nice. Okay, so we've turned our description of types, for, um, you know, of structural types into structural representations in the constant pool, and the constant pool retains this form rather than prematurely flattening it. And so you end up with these trees that describe types whose intermediate nodes are things like param type or array type, and whose leaves are things like type variable or int or a constant class. And you know, so uh, it's, it's a little bit of a change to the, um, how we interpret the class file format, because it always used to be that when uh, one constant refers to another constant, the type was always known. We're introducing a little bit of polymorphism where we say this type could be a parameterized type or an array type or something like that. Um, the result of all of this, and I know that was a bit of a deep dive, is by consolidating all the type information in the constant pool, now there's exactly one place where um, where we describe this thing as a T versus this thing as a U. Um, and this turns specialization of a class, which in the first model was very intrusive and complex, into specializing the constant pool. And in fact, a very dumb transformation on the constant pool. Um, and, and that in part is powered by storing the erasure at every point it's used, so that when you say, I want to specialize array list of erased, well, every time you see a type variable that refers to type variable number zero, you just copy the pre-computed erasure in and you're done. Um, and so uh, the, the, way, w the way our prototype works now, it does it in the class loader, but eventually it'll do it in the VM. Um, it walks through the constant pool, finds all these new constants, and just turns them into UTF-8s. Um, and so we make up a nominal representation for, uh, which is internal to the, you know, to, to, to the runtime for list of int, and when we see parameterized type of list parameterized with int, we turn it into whatever that name is. Um, and it, 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 it reduces to a class file that our existing VMs can ingest and, and, and manipulate. And then, you know, the, uh, once we push this into the VM, the VM is free to share the whole rest of the class. It only has to specialize of even a very small part of the constant pool, the part that has these new entries, um, which for a big class is a relatively small fraction of the constant pool. Uh, and then everything else about the class can be shared between list of int, list of float, list of erased. So it's a nice story. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, I've got an example class. It's generic in two type variables, and it's got some fields. One is an example of T and U. Uh, the next two are examples of, uh, these are static types of int and int, and int and string. And then I've got a, me a method M that takes example of T and U. Okay, so this is the piece of the constant pool that describes the relevant things here. Um, I hope everyone can read this in the back. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, these names correspond to constants 13, 24, 27, and 32. Um, so uh, the example of T and U turns into a parameterized type, where 11 means example, and 3 and 12 point to type variables that describe T and U. So if I want to specialize this for int and int, I specialize the type variables, and then there's a mechanical transformation to turn that parameterized type into a class name. Um, and so uh, if, if T and U are both erased, well, I'm going to turn um, uh, 3 and 11 into their erasure because the, the, um, the, the, the type variable carries around its uh, erasure. And, um, and then I specialize the you know, parameterized type into either the erased class or the intermediate runtime name I made up for the specialization of an example with int and int or example with int and erased. 
um, which you can see in like uh, 24 and 27 there. Um, and similarly, if I'm specializing you know, for uh, int and erased or for int and int, I get a slightly different specialization of the constant pool. Um, and the, 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 the bottom row shows this is what my method signature looks like. So the method signature for you know, an erased um, instantiation of example is the same as it's always been. Um, and then for uh, specialized examples, it has, um, it's, it's a, a method descriptor that points to the type uh, that gets specialized with some flavor of example. So it's pretty straightforward. And, and like I said, we have this all working. It works pretty nicely. OK, so I kind of lied. And I said, uh, all you have to do is specialize the constant pool, and you're done. Um, so what did I lie about? I lied about the bytecodes. So what do we, um, what do, we do about uh, bytecodes like a load and i load? Well, bytecodes can have operands that point in the constant pool too. So if I have this typed prefix uh, where the operand points into the constant pool and I use that to modify a more strongly typed bytecode, I can say typed reference to type variable number zero, a load zero. And then when I specialize the constant pool, that will specialize to object, and I'll know that this a load is moving an object. That's one way to do it. There's another way to do it. We can have u byte codes where we have u load, u return, u store, where u stands for universal, and these all have an extra operand. The actual bytecode syntax will figure that out. But basically, the idea is any place in the class file, whether it be the constant pool or the bytecode, that is type dependent will have a reference back into the constant pool to get the type information. And by the time you actually use this bytecode, that constant pool will already have been specialized. So even though the, con the, the class file itself is abstract, it has t's and u's in it, by the time you're actually using this class at runtime, those t's and u's have collapsed to either int or object or what have you. So uh, it, it, it's actually pretty straightforward. OK, so if you believe me that that works, um, you know, the next reasonable question is, all right, how do we represent these runtime types? I've got a bunch of runtime types that are derived from a single class file. I have list of int and list of float and list of erased. Um, and historically, we had this one-to-one -one relationship between source files, class files, runtime types. And over time, we've like exploded each one of those relationships, and this is kind of the last one, where we can have many runtime types that derive from a single class file. Um, so we've been using a term uh, to uh, called species to describe uh, multiple types that derive from a single class file. Um, and this is a pretty useful taxonomy uh, because uh, it means that class still means something. It means what source class, what class file did you come from? And that's separate from what is your runtime representation. So if I specialize list of int, its species is list of int, but its class is still list. And this is our trick for getting binary compatibility for, with code that says, you know, x dot get class and compares it to list dot class. That will still work. It still means what it means. And then if you want finer grain information, you, you have a different way of asking. All right. So what about generic methods? Generic methods are particularly tricky because they exist entirely today as a figment of the compiler's imagination. Um, the VM has no first class notion of, method, of a method the way it does of class. Um, but you know, since um, you know, code and generic method can refer to type variables uh, you know, from both de defined in the method and from enclosing types, um, we need a way of describing the specialization of a method. Um, and that means we need to include, if, if you have code that's inside a generic method, um, it needs to be described in that table of contents uh, that I described. So here's an example of how nasty it can get. You can have an outer class with an inner class that has a generic method, and the generic method has local classes in it, right? So in, you know, in that innermost method, I could refer to a type variable from one of my outer classes, from the outer method, from the, the, you know, the local class, et cetera. So uh, when we unroll this uh, in, into class files, that table of contents needs to include not only enclosing classes, but enclosing in, in, in generic methods. So you know, our current strategy is uh, that we take generic methods and we desugar them into classes. Um, and the advantage of this strategy is it takes something that we don't know how to do, specializing a method, turns it into something we do know how to do, specializing a class. So we take this class foo that has a generic method that's generic in any U, and we turn it into a synthetic class, um, you know, nested class, call it foo dollar m. We'll figure out what it's really called. Um, and uh, we can now specialize that class you know, um, separately 
And it, you know, when, when, we, when we specialize a generic method, we need not only the methods type parameters, but all the, method, all the type parameters for enclosing scopes. But since we've turned this into a class, that becomes a straightforward class specialization problem. Um, how, you know, this is kind of a leaky translation, a bunch of interesting questions about how to avoid this from leaking uh, too badly, stuff that we're working on, but this seems, to, this seems to work reasonably well. And then how do you invoke one of these? Well, you know, our favorite hammer, invoke dynamic. Uh, so invoke dynamic, uh, on, uh, to invoke a generic method, the, the, the bootstrap will be like invoke invoke generic method, the static type parameters, the static parameter list will include the type parameters of the generic method. At linkage time, it will go specialize the, the, the method class, or it'll go look it up in the system dictionary, and then link the call site to the appropriate entry point. Um, so that actually works pretty well. Okay, so one question that people might be asking is, so does this mean you finally reified generics and gotten rid of erasure? People love to ask this question. Um, and the answer is, well, it's more complicated than that, yes and no. A specialized class list of int is reified, but list of string probably won't be. It'll probably still be erased like it always was for all the same pragmatic reasons that we chose you know, 12 years ago. Um, now, interestingly, we have a way at the, uh, by, at the class file level to describe both list of reified string and list of erased string. We probably won't expose both at the Java language level. Other languages can make their own choice about whether they want to expose erasure or reification or both. Um, you know, so that way, it becomes the language's choice about how and when to erase. Uh, you know, in, in Java, we're very much constrained to compatibility with existing stuff, and so that is a strong reason to continue with erasure. But also, you know, not erasing means ballooning up your footprint, making a lot of you know, uh, duplication between list of int and list of float and, 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 and such. Another reason to not say, let's chuck erasure out the window and make everything reified, besides the fact that we'd have to throw all our libraries out, um, is if you look at real world generic code, a lot of it won't work under strictly reified generics. Um, you know, you have to do things like casting through raw or using unchecked operations to express what you want. And if those were impossible, people would say, this language sucks. Um, and so, we want people to be able to port existing libraries. That means the existing tricks have to still work. Um, and so Erasure is here to stay. Um, and it's you know, here to stay both for compatibility reasons and for pragmatism reasons. Um, but other languages that run on the JVM, if they want to pr pursue full, full reification, knock yourself out. In the, uh, in the translation for generic methods, you saw a new modifier that I snuck past you called species static. Um, and uh, this is actually a pretty cool thing. So right now, there's sort of two places you can put data in, in a class hierarchy. You can put them in an instance, or you can have static members, and you can put them in a class. And it turns out that uh, there's a lot of things that are really nice to put not in the class, but in the species, because the species has access to the, uh, the type parameters, whereas the class doesn't. Um, so there's a lot, there are lots of uses for this, like for things like caching an empty list or an empty array, um, tracking or interning how many of these have I instantiated, or let me inter intern this thing on construction, um, associating um, you know, things like uh, associated types where let's say you have list of T and you want to know, well, what's the corresponding type set of T? That's the kind of thing that you could store in a, um, you know, in a species static variable. Um, and lang the language implementation can use this as well. I'll give a couple examples. So um, here's, here's a common trick that people do uh, where they want to cache an empty list. They don't want to make a new object every time, so they want to have one object that represents empty lists. With erasure, totally easy. You just make a new empty erased list, and when someone says, I want an empty list of string, you just cast it to list of string, and you're, you go to the races. Well, that falls apart if the runtime type for list of int and the runtime type for list of float isn't the same. So what we can do is we can say, if you, associate, if you store this not as a class static, but as a species static, well, each species can have its own, um, its own empty list instance. And the erased species, which covers list of string and list of integer and list of shoe and all of that, there's one shared between all those erasures, and it just sort of works. 
Um, and so it's uh, useful for library writers to uh, use a species static placement as a place to put specialized versions of things or uh, associated things that are associated with the, uh, the specialized instantiation. It's also useful for uh, the compiler. So let's say we want to have reflective exposure to your type variable. So if I have a, a, a list of T, um, I want, might want to be able to say list.t, and maybe the answer comes back erased, but, if, you know, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe it says, you know, this is really a list of int. Well, this is another natural place to use species static, so the compiler could generate a synthetic field called t, um, in, in which it, it puts some reflective mirror, not clear whether it's a class or something else. Uh, Maurizio will have a lot more to, to say about this later today. Um, and so it brings the generics in, more into the programming model where you can say at runtime, what is T? And maybe the runtime says, well, all I know is it's erased, but maybe it says, you know, I'm an optional event. So that's a good example of pulling on the string, right? You know, you, you, that, that our, our, re, our runtime representation creates these things called species, and we want to bring that into the programming model in a way that's natural for the programmer. Um, so a bunch of other little things along the way. Um, uh, when we did, um, when we did interclasses in Java 1.1, we kind of faked accessibility. There's a mismatch between the language rules for what does private mean and the VM's rules for what does private mean. Um, and so uh, compilers tend to have to generate a little, um, little extra, downgrade the accessibility of things from like private to package and generate accessors like, you know, access dollar zero. How many people here have like stumbled over these accessor methods? Um, so what we would like to do is bring the, um, you know, bring the accessibility rules uh, sort of into alignment with this notion of multiple runtime types derived from one source type where class files form what we call a nest. A nest uh, largely corresponds to a, a source compilation unit or a single like top level you know family of classes and define accessibility within a nest and if you specialize list of int then that specialized species becomes a member of the nest of lists um, and this turns out to eliminate a lot of rough edges in the translation it's not a big deal but it's like something that's been an irritant for a lot of people who work with bytecode and it's something that we wanted to fix for a while um, worth noting this isn't friends this isn't a general purpose accessibility busting mechanism. This is more aligning the accessibility mechanism with how we tend to generate bytecode anyway. All right, last bit, and then I'll wrap up, um, is uh, once you have generics over values and particularly over things like numerics, it starts to become a lot more attractive to have uh, methods that are conditional to a particular instantiation. It makes total sense for list of int to have a sum method. It doesn't make any sense for list of shoe to have a sum method, right? So uh, it becomes attractive to be able to say, this method has a constraint. The constraint is that I'm only applicable uh, to receivers that have a certain type parameterization. Uh, again, syntax completely provisional, but the idea is pretty straightforward. I can expose methods that are conditioned on my, uh, on my parameterization. Um, and, uh, and this actually turns out to be not so hard to do, and it turns out to be both a migration compatibility feature for migrating libraries like InStream, but it's also an expressive feature for being able to say, I have a list of things, and if that thing knows how to add itself up, then I'm going to expose uh, a lifted sum method that, uh, that, that invokes that. Um, if you saw my talk last year, uh, we went, th went through uh, several painful iterations of our translation strategy, and one of the threads of that was the search for wildcards. Our initial strategy had no support for wildcards, which was, you know, to uh, pun intended, wildly unpopular. Um, it actually turns, it was actually kind of interesting that people complain endlessly about wildcards. It's like one of the most hated thing in Java, except what we discovered was even more hated than wildcards is what, when you threaten to take away people's wildcards. Um, but the reality is it's really hard to write generic code without them. There needs to be some common supertype that represents a list of something, but I don't know what the something is. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, if you have class foo of t extends bar of t, well, foo of wild should extend bar of wild, and foo of int should extend bar of int. Um, and you have these multiple supertypes of foo of int, and only one of them can be a class, so the others have to be something like interfaces, but interfaces can't have protected members or fields or a lot of other things, so it needs to be something new, it needs to be some kind of VM help here, and we're looking for the minimally intrusive thing, and we're not there yet. 
but it's, that's one of the, one of the areas of active uh, searching. Okay, um, and uh, reflection, we're gonna have a whole talk from Maurizio about reflection this afternoon, but all the questions I asked about how do I write down the type list of int, you could ask all the same questions about how do I reflect over list of int? How do I reflect over a template, list of T, and see which methods are partial and, and all of that? How do we reflect over generic methods? Um, and uh, this, is, this is another area where we've actually made dramatic progress, and you'll see that this afternoon. Um, and if you remember uh, our talk from two years ago, John talked about arrays 2.0, uh, which is a pretty ambitious thing. Some subset of that is needed here to be able to generify over array of T so that there's some common supertype between int array and object array. We haven't figured out what that is, but that's certainly part of our migration compatibility story. So, okay, that was a lot. And we're not done. We're in fact kind of just getting started because everything I outlined you know, up until now outlines like a pretty cool new programming model that lets us generify over a lot more things, lets us write one version of a lot of things instead of many cut and paste duplicated versions of some things, uh, which would be great if this was a new language, but Java isn't a new language and we have you know uh, trillions of lines of code out there. Um, so we need a story for migration. Um, and some APIs don't anyfy very well just as some APIs didn't generify very well. But anything the core libraries has to work, it has to be compatible, it has to be compatible for both clients and subclasses. We would like to be able to migrate types that are reference types now to be value types. Um, we would like to consolidate classes like instream into stream event where they kind of belong. Um, we'd like to consolidate the nine versions of array.fill into one generic method, um, which means we need tools for migrating existing classes that say, I used to look like this, but now I look like that. And if I have an old client that didn't get the memo, that's okay, we'll deal. Um, these, these features turn out to be a lot nastier, actually, than the core features, because they're just as complicated, maybe more complicated, and they're less generally useful, but they're still critical. So we have to do them. Um, and so, you know, we'd like, you know, so default methods, you know, in, in Java 8, we're kind of a down payment on this uh, of our ability to, to add new functionality to existing classes. We would like to be able to edit functionality of existing classes and change their signatures. So if I have an old type like date and uh, I have a method like, you know, get access date and it returns a date, I'd like to migrate it to return a local date time because that's the new recommended way, but the old stuff has to be there. So we need to figure out how to, um, how to migrate these signatures. Similarly, like ex uh, existing generic classes have things like overload of remove t against remove int. Oops, what if t can be int? Um, or worse, methods like map.get, which nobody uses, right? Um, what does map.get return? It returns a v. What does it return if the thing's not present in the map? Null. What if v is int? Oops. So there, there are some core APIs that are gonna have some real trouble you know, uh, with just a straightforward mechanical migration. So we need, they, they need some help. Um, and like I said, migrating you know, uh, reference classes to values, we would like to be able to do that. This is kind of like the motivation for our story of having like L and Q types, but that's not, um, that's not the whole thing. It doesn't get us uh, the, whole, the whole way there. Um, so we have like a rich set of problems on, uh, on migration that we also have made some progress on, um, but, uh, but we're not all the way there yet. We don't have a, a fully implemented solution yet. But it, it, it certainly makes sense that as we add language features, we'd like for the existing libraries to sort of stay up to the, you know, the level of the language so that they don't start to look you know, completely decrepit. And the older our libraries get, you know, the more important it is to be able to sort of keep them up to date. So this is an important aspect of this project. Um, okay, so wrapping up. We started out with one simple goal. I just want denser, flatter aggregates. I want complex and point to behave like int. So value types, great idea, yay, we're done, right? Um, well, that ripples into the bytecode set, type signatures, um, you know, that connects with arrays and generics, um, and all of our existing libraries happen to use arrays and generics. So it's a pretty long and nasty string that we've been pulling on. We've been pulling on it for about two years. We've exposed a lot of it. We know what a lot of it looks like. We're not done. Um, so we're gonna keep pounding our heads against this. Um, and like I said, some of these areas are now well understood. Some of them are still researched. At, 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 um, at, at, at Java One two years ago, James Gosling uh, talked about this project and, and he said, I think this is great, but you do realize that you've 
signed yourself up for like six PhD theses, right? And, you know, I didn't want him to be right, but he usually is, and he was in this case too. So, you know, we're maybe like two and a half of those six theses through, um, so making progress, lots more to do. Um, but you can play with this stuff. So we have a, a really nice prototype of any five generics in the compiler and the runtime. So uh, you can write, you know, uh, there's, there's a, um, a port of collections and streams that works over most types. Um, and there's a more limited prototype of value types in the, uh, the VM interpreter. Uh, so um, two documents uh, that, 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 uh, that give more detail on this, and there's a uh, implementation in the code repo at the Valhalla project at OpenJDK. Um, and uh, with that, I'm done. Um, thanks for listening, and we're gonna have a workshop later this afternoon where you can ask all your questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>